afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this Dragon's Den pitching session. So basically, the LDN Fund is intended to turn a challenge, the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, into an opportunity by being a major source of catalytic finance, investing in sustainable land use. And the fund is especially taking the challenge of bringing private capital in these uh, new sectors in order to help the landscape investment uh, area become a, a, a real asset class. And so you can see on, the, uh, on this first slide the two logos of the, of, the, of the entities that have teamed up to create such a fund. On the one hand, the UN Convention uh, to Combat Desertification, uh, and on the other, Mirova, a management company, subsidiary of Natixis Group, a, fan, a French banking group. And for, for the past uh, six months, we have uh, carried out a full market analysis as well as a feasibility study to come to the conclusion of a, I mean, relevant positioning for the fund. And by the way, a report called Unlocking the Market for Land Degradation Neutrality is available today and released today at the Global Landscape Forum. You can find it at the table outside of the conference. And so the, the main outcomes of this report is to explain how the fund, the LDN fund, should rely on the left on the left hand side on a relevant investment approach and on the right hand side on a on, on tailored structuring principle. So regarding the uh, investment approach, what is uh, important of course is to uh, address land degradation and to promote projects that contribute to land rehabilitation or, or degradation avoidance. In other words, the fund is really promoting, in general, sustainable land use. So what, is the what are the main sectors targeted? We intend to target sectors of sustainable agriculture, for instance, agroforestry project, tree crop uh, projects, or, um, or sustainable cattle, as for example. In the forestry sector, of course, there are very good reforestation or afforestation projects. And we also see attracting, attractive uh, project in the field of so-called green infrastructure. So for instance, tree planting in urban area that contribute to uh, stormwater runoff or combination of agriculture and production of renewable energy. Um, and of course, the scope of the fund is worldwide because SDGs are a global, are a global objective by definition. So we intend to invest in a project worldwide. And in terms of uh, eligibility criteria, it's also, of course, uh, important for a project to meet strict environmental and social standards uh, and have a potential for scalability, replicability, and of course, being bankable to attract the private sector. And so the relevant investment approach found is really providing what the market needs. And based on the market analysis, we really see that to finance an important capex that will transform the land use we need to provide long-term financing that can be repaid by this new land use over time. But financing is not uh, sufficient. We also need to bring technical assistance. And this is why alongside the fund, a technical assistance facility financed by donor will also be created to help the project become investment ready. And also what is critical is to uh, provide governance and, and coordination with other public initiatives. And to facilitate again and create value with the project, we have decided not to do this by ourselves. There are great forces out there. People have been creating this uh, nascent sector for the past year. So the idea is to leverage an existing initiative and team up with large corporations that are willing to improve their supply chains and also with landscape investment specialists that have implemented a pilot project and are willing to scale them up. So this is the, the, the main uh, ideas for, the, um, for this uh, investment approach. And we think that there are critical uh, elements there to, to meet success. On the other side, for the while we believe the asset class is really attractive, it's a nascent market, so we need to find ad adapted structuring principle to attract the private investors. And um, the, the main elements that uh, came of our work is that, first of all, we need to uh, pro propose a robust investment vehicle. We need to speak the same language as uh, investors are, are used to speaking and, and providing a, a regulated uh, uh, investment fund, so namely an alternative investment fund under EU regulation that provides sufficient comfort to investors to be managed, privately managed by a regulated management company, namely Mirova, that has internal risk, compliance, legal departments, and a team of experts with skills in the field of 
uh, commodity finance, structured finance, project finance, the idea is not to reinvent the wheel, but apply existing techniques for this new sector. And the other key element is the layered st structure that will be, uh, that will be uh, adopted, which consists of providing different risk return shares um, for the fund. There are junior shares to be uh, subscribed mainly by donors and governments that would be repaid and reimbursed after senior shares. The senior shares are those that are paid in priority, so if they have a, a better uh, risk return profile. And the fact that the junior share exists is a critical and catalytic element to, raise, uh, to reach a critical size and, and, and raise more massive uh, capital from the private sectors. And on top of this layered structure, the fund may also issue notes with higher liquidity and, and lower risk to attract even more private capital. So, as you uh, understand, the main added value for this project is really to assemble the various pieces of the puzzle in order to bring scale in the market, provide visibility to the sectors, and unlock the market for land degradation neutrality. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Gauthier. Um, my dear jurors, um, are there any clarification questions that you would like to ask, or? No? Okay. Then, Tom, um, how, would you, as an in, how would an investor basically evaluate uh, the return on this investment and the impact it has? Not easily, um, <laughs> would be my initial answer, but that may well come from the terms of this uh, mm -hmm. panel that we're having, and there may be many other documents that, uh, that I've not seen to do that. Uh, the things that I would start with, uh, this, is, this is a fund that is, is dealing with, with rehabilitation, and I assume the fund has specifications as to what it is that I am buying when I buy into the fund. In other words, is it an equity return? Is it a debt return? Uh, I, I can't tell that here. You, you, you may well have that specified. So it's a little hard for me to, um, to, to answer. Um, on the whole, I would, when I'm dealing with a fund, uh, given whatever the particular terms and conditions of, of the fund would be, uh, expect a, a benchmarked commercial return. Uh, that, that I can look at with a variety of other funds. Now, uh, one of the questions that I would have that would help me to answer that would be, and, and you may again have this, please forgive me if, if I'm you know, going over things that have been done, but I mean, there, there are many different types of rehabilitation projects. I suppose the biggest one that comes to mind immediately in these days of, uh, of an El Nino year uh, would be peatlands in, in Indonesia uh, that are creating such a, a disastrous uh, uh, flow of carbon into the atmosphere um, because of the combustion effects of, of and particularly the drying of this year. Um, I, I guess I would like to have a better sense of whether that sort of rehabilitation is covered because generally that involves flooding the lands uh, again, uh, taking out systems uh, that have been put in to create navigable waters uh, um, it, to, to access these. It's, it's a little hard to see what the, the, the revenue flow is yeah. that I would be looking at for this return. In other words, it would seem to be a highly uh, publicly charged activity, and so I might like to see the returns described that could come from um, different carbon markets that, that one might imagine over the life of this fund being the source of my return. And that could be uh, that, that the, these are um, broad trading markets uh, under some sort of a generalized red plan. It could be a binational uh, Indonesian-Japanese uh, uh, bilateral arrangement that is discussed in the uh, in, in the Paris Accords. So 
I mean, for, for pure things, I would like to see that. Um, for, for something like investment in the rehabilitation of lands that have been trampled by cattle in the Brazilian savanna, there is a, a commercial flow that's there. And, and, and what I need, and again, this is not critical of this, but what I need to answer the question uh, are data um, about those particular uh, types of activities. The only question that I would highlight um, is that in the white paper, I did see that one of the criteria for uh, two of the criteria are that they, the fund would take into account in, in forming its portfolio of investments uh, what is called readiness to invest. And it says the LDN fund does not intend to offer subsidies. So particular projects should have already reached a maturity stage uh, with the potential for preliminary technical assistance provided through the technical uh, assistance facility that's associated with the fund. Um, I, I would be quite interested to understand uh, exactly what that implies. If it doesn't offer subsidies, it would seem that the investor could expect a commercial yeah. return and perhaps it is simply the difference between uh, the cost of borrowing of this firm and the cost of borrowing of another investor that would describe that. But that would be both an important uh, uh, constraint on what I thought were the non-commercial returns. And then after, if, if it's a commercial return, then I would expect the benchmarking that I saw earlier. OK, thank you. Um, now, um, Elvira, um, how would you uh, rate the uniqueness of the proposal that we just listened to? Well, that's a nice question. Um, before I start, let me just uh, briefly uh, highlight that I'm sitting in for somebody who's, I think, cruising above uh, London and can't land. So uh, here I am. You have to deal with me. Um, I am a fund manager, but I will not give it back to Mirova. <laughs> but uh, rather share the experience that we have gained over the last 10 years uh, undergoing due diligence as a various investors, private, public, uh, family offices, etc. So um, we're being quizzed on a monthly basis by various investors. Um, so I very much relate to, to what you uh, said today, and it's a horror job to present uh, two years' work, if not longer, in five minutes. So thank you for that. We will, um, we will have the breakout sessions. <laughs> very good, very good. Um, I would want to uh, answer the question in a, in a broader sense. Is it, is it unique um, and what does it actually mean? I, I think it's very unique to tackle the, the challenges that you've uh, outlined on a global scale. I think nobody's dared that before and that will give you sleepless nights for sure. Um, and it is very much unique to be doing this with what you called implementing partners, if I understood this correctly. But this is also where my questions would come from. Um, from the funds that, that we manage, from what we see um, in, in the investment uh, sphere, what, what we've learned is the more specialized you are, the more focused you are, which trickles down in the focused nature of the capital that you're raising, in the focused assets that you do, the easier it typically is. Now, what I heard is you have these nexus topics, you have agriculture and forestry. I think that can be combined, but I found it hard to, to actually understand where the green infrastructure component comes in. How will that interrelate? What does it do to your capital structure? What does it do to your asset class? What does it do to you want to be an AF, uh, AIF, so a fully regulated, highly governed fund? So things like risk limits, diversification limits come into play. Uh, not sure where this is going to be domiciled, um, but you also need to explain the asset classes to your regulator. Um, so these were my immediate questions uh, um, because it goes then hand in hand with a reporting load to, to all, all parties. And, of course, diverse capital bases, diverse investors are lovely unless you have to deal with them. <laughs> so uh, that, that certainly is an aspect. Uh, if you need to cater to too many agendas, um, that can easily um, be, um, be quite a challenge. Um, yeah, very, very unique, I would say. Um, but I found it easier to understand the liability side of your business and the asset side, as I already said. Um, 
And what, what I would want more clarity on is actually how do you define success and impact? What is it at the end of the day that the fund really stands for? Sorry if I'm eating into your, <laughs> your feedback. Um, uh, and, and how do you actually ensure that you deliver? Uh, whose fund is it at the end of the day? Is it Mirova's fund? Is it UN, uh, UN's fund? Is it somebody else's fund? And what follows from that? How is the incentive structure built? Um, how do you make sure that whoever is party to what delivers and how all of that mm. interplays? But again, I think you have all the answers. You've only been given five minutes, so... Um, yeah, I love the TA component. Um, I think that's that's very very important. Um, but again, if you if you can be clearer in, in how actually that strengthens your business case, um, that that'd be very nice. I'll stop here. Thanks. Okay. Um, the first, I didn't get a clear sense of the size of the fund that you think you can raise or want to build. So I don't know whether you give me some rough. Yeah. So that that matters obviously. Um, the second thing is that if you think you, if you think a billion is is feasible <coughs> as a capital raise, um, then uh, from from how many sources? I mean, how many investors do you think you need to get to a billion? And uh, and can you really be sure that they're aligned with your mission? When I speak from very direct experience here, um, <laughs> that it's fine when things are going well. It, sometimes isn't when things are going not so well. So to, to raise a billion from a wide range of investors, you need to be really, really sure that they, they are 100% with all of your mission, including the modest amount you'll spend on technical assistance, because believe me, they'll focus on that if anything goes wrong. So, so that's, that's the first thing. The, the second thing is um, you're attempting to, to, you know, one more time with feeling, <laughs> build a new asset class. And so, because of the novelty, you're going to need to be extra careful about that alignment of interest, including all of the standard compensation for fund management that is on offer, the range of in the marketplace. And uh, because it's a new asset class, uh, you ha I don't know precisely what your term is. I mean, uh, one of the great difficulties about accumulating assets that have these aspirations attached to them is that they're not susceptible to uh, easy realization in ready-made markets. So the term is really important. And I, I think building a blind pool of capital for a fixed term with a wide range of projects is really hard. I mean, ideally, you want permanent capital you know, in our dreams. But if you have term capital, you need length and a high degree of flexibility to cope with the fact that many of these investments will not be ready in a standard private equity term, for example. So I'd be, I'm really curious to know how do you access quite large amounts of capital when your structure is both novel and not susceptible to uh, easy liquidity, which is partly a question Tom was asking, because it's not clear how much of this is ready for large uh, liquid capital markets and how much is going to be illiquid and long-term and tied up in complicated uh, investment structures. And then I was also going to ask the question Elvira asked, which is, if ultimately you want to get this asset class established and push it into the mainstream, then you have a very difficult judgment to make about what uh, standards of, uh, if you like, non-financial performance you want to promote. I don't think you should compromise on that, personally, but don't underestimate how difficult that is to do. And assume that much of the market will be very interested in the meeting, but won't actually invest today. So. It may well be that you have to build your longer term strategy on, a, on perhaps a smaller amount with investors who you are definitely going to be aligned with, who do want those objectives and are prepared to pay you to assess the outcomes and then go back into the marketplace when you've proved a few people um, and go and get some more.
Okay, thank you all. Uh, I saw that uh, Godier was nodding, the public couldn't see it, he was writing down uh, all the questions, so I think it will be a very, very interesting breakout session. Thank you very much and thank you, Gauthier. Um, so <laughs>
NOS has been working with a community of 100 fishermen um, and 500 individuals that um, derive their livelihood from, um, from the fishery. And they, they um, have persuaded the community to implement a managed access um, system to the lagoon. Currently, the population of the uh, lagoon, the shellfish population, shall I say, is 3 million shells. If you restrict access to that, it can reproduce uh, um, up to three times that population annually. And um, research suggests that the carrying capacity is 65 million shells. So we're going to invest effectively into implementing managed access on the lagoon and into the supply chain around that so that the, the community um, who have set up a cooperative can harvest at a sustainable level, that's about 20% of the um, carrying capacity, and that they can then brand that and market it in, uh, the shellfish into local markets in Baja, California, into Mexico City, and eventually into the United States. Um, effectively, the, the fund will provide the project investment for um, the infrastructure for managed access, and it will derive a return from repayment of a loan and potentially a benefit share if a certain threshold is exceeded. Um, it's anticipated that the, um, the, the project will result in 200 um, jobs um, being supported and a further 500 family members being supported by the project. Um, so let me talk a little bit about um, our approach and where we're coming from. What we're effectively doing is taking what we've developed through the Althelia Climate Fund and that we know works on land and applying it in a new sector, the marine environment. So four key components of that. A clear investment mechanism, so we look for diversified project cash flows accruing from certified commodities, rights, quotas, products and ecosystem services, um, thereby achieving diversification of risks ac um, across the portfolio. Um, we will make investments into projects in the form of loans, um, and the idea is that they will be tailored to um, enable a transition to sustainability. So that effectively means flexibility around um, debt service, potentially um, repayment holidays, bullet repayments, etc. Um, but we will also seek to benefit from the transition to sustainability. So that could be from a proportionate share in um, yield from an uplift in value um, created from the investment. Um, the overall mechanism allows for um, enhanced yield structure. Um, it provides optionality upside for the, for the fund, but also a natural exit um, at the end of the tenor of the fund. The second feature is um, strong local partnerships and um, scientific partnerships at the fund level. So we, we have the active involvement now of Conservation International and Environmental Defence Fund at the fund level. They are acting as te technical and scientific advisors to the fund and serve on the fund's expert board. And on the ground, we have a strict policy of um, involving project stakeholders, um, local NGOs uh, and other um, kind of interested parties at a local level um, to ensure that um, there is alignment of interest um, that enables us to effectively manage risk in an improved way and also identify the potential to scale up investments. Um, so the, th the third feature is we, we um, are selecting mature and semi-mature projects and then looking for opportunities to scale. So the, the case study that I uh, presented, um, we, we visited that project and we've done some initial due diligence and we've identified five or six further opportunities along the um, peninsula where the same model could be uh, applied. And that's key. So for every dollar that we invest, we're looking for the opportunity to invest um, the next five or six dollars. Um, our values, we have a strict um, investment decision process um, and this is built around a core ESG, Environmental, Social and Governance Sustainability Thesis. Um, we're looking for projects that can demonstrate conservation of threatened or at-risk species, biodiversity or habitats. Um, we're looking for um, positive impacts on the lives of local stakeholders, communities and economies. And we're looking for sustainable best practices to be incorporated into the supply chains of whatever products we um, get behind and, and invest in. So I'll finish up by saying how we're moving forward. Um, we're aiming to reach a first close for the fund during this calendar year. Um, 
two features that could be of interest to investors is we are um, we're quite far advanced negotiating a um, first loss facility for private side investors with uh, a major bilateral. Um, and we're also looking to repeat the innovative conservation notes mechanism that we have for the Alphelia Climate Fund, which would enable um, smaller um, impact um, driven investors to invest into the, into the fund. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Elvira, can you please um, assist the investors in the room in evaluating the return on this investment? How would you do that? Um, I think I would repeat <laughs> what was said uh, with regard to, to the first proposal. Um, I think one, one simply needs more clarity on what exactly is, is the asset class, what exactly is the risk that one would be taking, um, and, and, and what are also the impact considerations. Um, the higher the impact you want, uh, the more capacity building, monitoring you, you need to do on the ground. Um, most likely the, the longer out the return will be uh, for some of the investors. So I think th there needs to be more, more clarity on that exactly what, what and, and maybe it ties back to what I said earlier, what exactly is the objective of the fund? Is it uh, to sustain the source fish? Is it to maintain livelihoods of, of the fishers? Is it to protect uh, the marina? Is, what exactly is it, or is it is it a multitude, or is it interdependent uh, uh, um, objectives, which I assume it is, but maybe it wasn't wasn't so clearly presented. Um, but again, uh, five or seven minutes, whatever it was, yeah. it's very short. Um, so I think um, it is maybe from from an immediate perception a more tangible asset class than what we heard earlier. Um, you also seem to zoom in on certain regions um, and then try it there and then try to replicate it, which, um, um, which sounds good, raises other issues of diversification and risk management, but, but that's because if something hits, then it hits across that segment uh, where you try to, to intervene um, into, um, into the market. Um, so yeah, d difficult to say uh, what what really return expectations could be, but but maybe a couple of um, of other questions. Um, when we look at assets like that, uh, projects like that, always the question of local law comes in, local regulation, uh, local communities, local stakeholders. How are you going to manage that? Where exactly is the expertise for this type of asset class, either with you or with whoever is is uh, engaged in the network? Um, uh, and um, what does it actually mean for the currencies you will provide for, I assume this is not the only uh, deal you would go after, you would, you would uh, look at other uh, countries as well. Um, so how are you going to manage that also from the liability side or from your hatching side um, to, to provide responsible capital? Same, same question could have been posed to the other uh, pitch as well. Um, and then linked to the expertise for this type of asset class, how are you going to source further deals? Um, what makes what is what is the filter process for eligible deals or projects? Sorry for the word deal, but uh, could have as well said transactions. Um, and one other topic came up uh, when I was listening to you is how do you um, uh, benchmark what you think are your criteria of success, your objectives, your impact. Uh, um, desires to existing benchmarks, existing certificates and labels, um, the Marine Stewardship Council and, and, and others. Where are you in that? Are you more severe in, in the selection? Are you a little bit more relaxed? Uh, does it depend? <laughs> um, these would be interesting um, questions to follow up on. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Now, James, uh, the uniqueness of the proposal? Uh, yes, I'll get down just one second because I wanted to <laughs> emphasize the, the law uh, and not just the domestic law or the local rules but international law. Um, this is an area, a couple of us at least out here have done some work on in the past and what you're trying to do um, is reimagine landscapes that are subject to all sorts of 
difficulties in international law and domestic law, real contests over the access to those resources. And, and I think it's something you're going to have to build in to, to your analysis. Of, and may, maybe even have some further conversation about how, it, how the jurisdictional issues might limit or, or even attract some of your investments. But um, let me uh, properly answer the question, which is that this is very innovative and, uh, and come about time too. And I really do like the idea that attention is being placed on this enormous resource that is, is uh, improperly valued by our economic systems, which, by the way, is a major issue, that much of the value that I think you would create through investment will, will, will struggle to be reflected in your returns, uh, just because of the, of the newness and novelty of it. Um, I particularly like the fact that you've thought through how you might combine public and private money. I think you've sensibly aimed at a modest uh, raise of 100 million. Uh, the first loss facility I like. The conservation notes I always like because it does offer, offer scope for smaller investors or other conservation groups or, or even ultimately individuals to, to have a small piece of the, of the investment effort. And I, I've always liked that. I think that's, that's innovative and, and will be productive in this case. Uh, I, I think you will find that, that once you've opened up this box, you won't have any difficulty finding things to invest in. In fact, one of the things I imagine will happen is you'll really struggle to screen out things. There'll be a huge range of really compelling local fisheries investments, um, lots of uh, 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 multiple bene benefit investments too that might take 20 years to realize the third, fourth, and fifth benefit, but it's at least enough in the first and second to get it started, provided your investors are willing to stay the course. So, yeah, on innovation and and uh, the kind of uh, opening up new frontiers for investment in Great conservation, score. scores very highly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. Um, Tom, uh, would you like any to add any further recommendations or advice to the picture? Well, firm? I think this is really just advice if it has any value about pitch. I'm, I'm now treating myself as someone who's listening to a lot of pitches mm -hmm. during sure. the day, and so what stands out? I guess the things that, that stood out from, and, and I did read the, the white paper, uh, uh, question of diligence. I mean, basically, the, the fund is described as covering minerals, fishing, commerce, and trade, and health. Okay, now, I, I start to wonder about how it is that such a wide range of activities, united by the fact that they happen on the liquid surface of this planet, uh, has enough in common that I can expect the diligence to be, be effective in sorting out um, projects that are investable. The second thing, and this may be my mistake, but it's what I heard, uh, I used to find when I first started doing this a long time ago, I would get, once we solicited a lot of proposals in, in, in the early days of climate change, and they would come in and they would say, um, here's a project that we would like you to offer some sort of uh, uh, exceptionally uh, uh, publicly conscious investment for, I don't know what to call impact, whatever it is. Um, and it's got a 325% internal rate of return. You know, my reaction was always the same thing, which was, here, let me recommend a list of banks to you, uh, and, uh, and, and go out, 325%, uh, that's terrific. And, but if you combine that with things like first loss and strange forms of, of, of you know, particularly risky cover, it's hard to figure out how they come together. So what I, what I think is needed is some sense of, I, I think at one point it was said, it, this sustainable shellfish operation, according to EDF or someone else who was cited, is three times as valuable as, as, non, as non sustainable activities. I, I mean, that sounds great to me. Uh, go out and do it, but, uh, uh, if, if that's the case. Um, and um, usually there's something else that has to be there in that story. Maybe 
it comes back to some of the things that James was mentioning. Is there some policy change or some legal change that has to occur that enables this three times production um, that, that, that is, is, is proffered here? And then if that is the case, then the real risk gets associated with either the passage, the establishment of that, or the, uh, the, the risks uh, associated with its enforcement and gaming. So I think those are very important things to, uh, to have at least in your pocket that, that are, and understand that uh, experienced investors are going to go there. I, in this particular case, uh, I may be pointed in that direction because there have been fantastic schemes in the southern part of the Mar de Cortez having to do with fishing, sustainable fishing, limited fishing, and they completely fell apart because of corruption in the allocation. Of, of the licenses, and, and so treat the risks openly, and, and uh, mm -hmm. that's my only suggestion. Okay, that's a very valuable one. Thank you very much. Thank you to the jurors, and thank you, David. I hope you can address some of the points during the breakout. Yeah. <laughs> okay, now we're going to move on to our third pitch which is uh, brought to us by Oliver Hanke from Nature Bank. This is a local investment opportunity in uh, cocoa growing in the Dominican Republic. It is uh, private equity driven, so it might be interesting to some of the finance professionals and experts in the room today. Oliver, why should we invest in cocoa in the Dominican Republic? Well, the floor is you. yours. Thank you very much. Yes, I think it's a bit different to what we heard before. It is, as you said, it's a single commodity strategy. It's a single market, so we've got a very different risk profile here. And um, uh, obviously, um, maybe also a bit more bottom-up than, than what we've heard before. However, um, it is a scalable initiative and something that um, is building on uh, a year worth of detailed research in the Dominican Republic by our group. As Nature Bank maybe is a fairly new setup, I, I may use a couple of my seconds to introduce it just so you understand what we're doing. Well, basically, it's a Canadian group that um, is um, a group of sustainable commodity experts uh, with uh, set up in Canada, United States, Germany, and, well, I'm based in Switzerland. Um, essentially, we're producing sustainable commodities. Uh, here, we're talking about um, cocoa. Uh, but we also have uh, expertise, um, substantial expertise as, uh, as project developers, particularly in the field of carbon forestry, um, in the field of uh, sustainable biomass, and of course in, uh, in, in cocoa. Um, so we originate projects, we finance them, we develop them, and um, they may be greenfield projects, they may be brownfield projects. So I don't know if you can actually see this, uh, just to basically show this is an amalgamation of different organizations that have come together last year, and we've, we've got project expertise all over the world. What you'll realize, though, is uh, we have a strong focus on Central America and northern parts of, of South America. Right, jumping into it. Holistic approach to cocoa. That's important, obviously, because we're not, the investment case is about investing into the entire uh, cocoa production value chain. So, um, what our um, in-house consultancy can offer is a strong expertise on doing exactly that. Um, basically from trader uh, to grave, from bean to bar, uh, producing cocoa and taking care not only of the growing part, but also of the um, fermenting, drying, the processing, the marketing. So the idea is to um, go as direct as possible, establish offtake agreements directly with in this case, European um, organic and, and, and sustainable um, chocolate manu uh, or certified chocolate manufacturers, and um, uh, to basically um, build a, a strong, reliable, and, and direct uh, value chain in the Dominican Republic. Now, um, I really like this chart. It's I'm not sure if you can read it, but it shows the, the value generation. I mean, the the cocoa-related chocolate markets or confectionery market is got about a worth of 100 billion US dollars as per now. Now much of that, the bulk is what you see down there, is prices that currently fetch about $3,000 per ton, per metric ton. Um, 
there are substantial premium being paid for cocoa, either because of certification or because of quality, flavor, basically. So, and as you can see here, the prices range from, as I said, $3,000 even up to $10,000 plus per ton. Now, these are really specialty, uh, single origin, high, uh, high flavor, uh, uh, cocoa, or rarities rather. Huh? <coughs> what we focus on is the finer flavor market, the certified uh, finer flavor market, which you can see in this middle bracket, aiming at prices of 3000 to maybe $5,000 per ton. Right, jumping on. Um, the organic food market, why is it important <coughs> in this context? The Dominican Republic, um, in the grander scheme of things, is a tiny market, a tiny producer market, as uh, I think 70 or more percent of the, of the world cocoa production comes from Western Africa. Uh, however, it is, by a number of, because of a number of reasons I'm not going to explain, uh, the, the world leader in organic cocoa production. And um, again, this is just an example, but generally speaking, organic food consumption uh, is by and far outgrowing uh, general food market trends. So this is an example. I just realized I picked a slightly older chart, but anyway, it just continues like that. Um, uh, a constant annual growth rate of 13.70% to um, uh, an overall value of 35, as it is per uh, 2015, 35 billion um, um, uh, of value of the organic food market in the US. Now, the uh, overall food market in the US grows by 3%, and the same ratio, more or less, can be applied to cocoa. What you see is growth rates of, of more than 20% compared to, to 2% or 2.5% actually of the overall market. Now, why the Dominican Republic? The Dominican Republic is a special place. It uh, obviously is an established uh, cocoa growing market. Uh, it's about 40,000 smallholders active in that particular market, a population of about 10 million. Uh, it is a, a, a big island, but a small market, a very well established infrastructure. From no point uh, you have more than two or three hours to the next port. Logistics are very important in, in cocoa mm -hmm. processing and production. Um, so there are, uh, it's, a, it's an agricultural market, which has got its problems. Uh, it showed um, substantial growth as one of the strongest growing markets in the region. However, uh, there still is um, a prevailing poverty, and in particular the cocoa, uh, cocoa market, as I said, 40,000 growers, have been coming from uh, traditionally a market producing very poor quality, uh, driven by recent innovation over the last couple of years, uh, into becoming um, a producer of quality, um, certified and, and, and organic. Uh, cocoa, but there still can be done much more. Now, our objective is to develop up to 3,000, possibly even 5,000 hectares of cocoa plantation, certified parts of it organic uh, certified cocoa production. As I said, we focus on final flavor cocoa. Um, that equates to an overall value of 100 to 150 million US dollars. Uh, all of it, as I said, um, direct investment, private equity. Uh, that's not, we're not, we're not shy of debt financing, so uh, if you want to offer us, uh, that to us, it's, it's, it's all good, but uh, that is the focus. Um, the typical, it's a, it's, um, the objective is to establish a, a leading cocoa company locally, which will coordinate a number of different investments all over the island, becoming lighthouse projects for the surrounding, basically offering an outgrower concept for the surrounding uh, smallholder farmers, offering superior, high-yielding uh, seed and um, grafting material, planting material essentially, offering um, uh, <coughs> centralized um, uh, modern processing facilities. As I said, much of the quality is derived in the cocoa uh, as part of the processing process, um, and, and ultimately also offering the, um, the, the marketing and, and exporting. Uh, sorry, uh, marketing and exporting um, um, to the projects associated with this initiative. We have established and secured the, the all-important seed investment, um, which uh, allows us to secure um, um, uh, established, high-quality, high-yielding, uh, top-performing thinkers uh, that will uh, act as, as, as lighthouse, basically, allowing us to, to grow, develop new, um, new project areas. Right, 
just quickly, this is what a typical cocoa um, cash flow looks like. Now, cocoa is great. I mean, if you if you look at the back end, it uh, it yields stably once once fully mature or fun, once fully productive, it yields uh, for more than 30 years. If uh, and if you rejuvenate it uh, well and in time, you can continue to produce a very high productivity. Uh, for a very long time, and you see your annual uh, returns of maybe about 20%, and these are conservative um, inputs. Um, that's our style. Uh, however, you do also see the problem, which is, as with many perennial crops, the long lead time until you actually generate returns. Um, so, obviously, a bit of um, intelligent engineering is required here. Now, here I've only been presenting the direct project finance investment case. Uh, Nature Bank <coughs> is uh, listed at the Toronto Stock Exchange, Venture Exchange, and um, uh, seeks to establish itself as a land developer, developing the projects up to operational maturity, so in order to make the case more attractive to financial investors, A, and B, the plan is to develop a, uh, a dedicated cocoa fund, which will be diversified across several jurisdictions, so not only the Dominican Republic, addressing obviously a number of issues around diversification um, um, that will buy into the latter uh, more, let's say, annuity-oriented uh, cash flow properties of, of cocoa. Now there's many more things to be said, which I won't, so um, thank you. Thank you very much. So James, back to the uh return evaluation question. Yes, yeah, so thank you very much, uh, Oliver. Much depends on what the investment is in. I mean, it's clear that there are uh, accessible rates of return that can be understood in the growing of the commodity. And it's clear that there are uh, companies that do both <laughs> growing and marketing of the, of the commodity, and you could track their performance as a, as a stock investment, even on the private markets, you'll be able to find data on who's doing well producing and, and, uh, and marketing a product. Um, but I'm also very curious in what you finished up with, namely, uh, in the end, am I investing in Nature Bank um, so that it can provide a facility that enables more investments of this particular type to be made? So, <laughs> okay, right, because that makes a big difference. Also, it, it, it completely transforms my view of the nature of the investment. Am I making a project investment? Am I making, a, you know, so, so you've got the point. And, and I think you'll need to be very clear about that when you go out to an investor base because, of course, the ecosystem is very varied and some will be interested in the, in the listed nature bank investment and some will be interested in the, you know, the emerging market project investment or this. A smaller group will be interested in that, and you need to know very carefully who you're pitching to. So, um, but of course, it is interesting to to imagine a sustainable agriculture business being invested in that could take responsibility for the whole supply chain, and therefore set standards for others, provided it's a good story over a period of time, uh, so that we feel more confident that we can marry uh, investments that are designed to produce, for example, increased yield, and those who look after soil and, and other aspects of the, uh, of the ecosystem that produce the value in the product, the ultimate product. And that more of the value can be retained uh, in the corporate entity that can look after the interests of a smallholder that they have a commercial relationship with, all the way through to the consumer that's buying it in a, maybe a, in a market where there's a very substantial markup, as your graph shows. So I'd like to imagine that it's possible to build those kinds of enterprises with the right kind of capital. And so it's attractive to me that you're, that you're having a go. But it also does need to be made really plain that it's, that it's Nature Bank in principle that, that is going to carry a variety of investments <laughs> rather than a single estate, if you like. Okay. Okay, thanks, uh, James. Um, Tom, I'll turn myself to you. Uh, how, how would you rate the uniqueness of the proposal? 
that's a, that's a hard question in the sense that um, there, there are many proposals that I've seen that come to deal with a particular problem that I will describe in a second as, as more generic. But they're not really generic because they have geographical and, and, and uh, agronomic uh, propositions. And they are often very much related to the history of particular industrial organization or production patterns. So this is a tailored project with a tailored instrument within a uh, class of, uh, of investments that are uh, propping up, forgive the term, uh, across the world in many different fields, coffee in Nicaragua, whatever. The, the generic issue, as far as I can see it, uh, is that uh, uh, there are quality dimensions to this market that can produce higher returns, but apparently the dominant form is not in agribusinesses who are who are taking advantage of this um, uh, at the present time because you could do that. You could buy the land, rent the land, and run an agribusiness. It seems to me that what you are after here is a particular production model <coughs> having to do with smallholders and outgrowers. And, and so the, 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 the problem or, the, or the, the interesting part of this investment is particularly the maintenance or, or the propagation of that uh, particular uh, pattern of industrial organization because it has sustainability elements, certainly in terms of income uh, distribution. And uh, what we have is, is apparently we have a, uh, a, a, an industrial form that would demand training, replanting, uh, periods, looking at the, the income flow, uh, in which the, uh, the negative, the, the, the income is, is, is negative uh, for the smallholders to do it themselves. They may not be credit worthy. And so looking for a form that can take advantage of the economies of scale apparently needed and retraining to do this, this, uh, this uh, to get into the higher quality part of the markets and, uh, uh, and yet to do that in a way that preserves the, uh, the agricultural investment. Very, very similar in some ways to the turns in Brazil in the 80s in coffee, uh, where they had mixed everything through a marketing board, then realized there were huge gains to separating the crop quality, and managed that essentially through a government entity. Um, you're planning to do it on, on the private side. Um, I, I think it's, it's really uh, quite interesting, and I think we'd have to look with, with some care at the capital, the reasons for capital constraints on doing it directly with outgrowers, and then trying to uh, take care of, to, to mitigate those capital constraints by putting an intermediary organization that has scale. Uh, I, f I find it interesting, and I assume that in more detail, uh, those questions would be answered. Okay, thank you. Uh, Elvira, a final word of uh, recommendation to Oliver Hank. Okay. Uh, given that he's German, um, I can be a little bit tougher. <laughs> 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 Representing a PE uh, fund uh, <laughs> model. I had the benefit of chatting with him before. So um, uh, what, what I think we, we would gain from is to understand better where actually your comparative advantage is versus others. If it is this easy, and this is really easy in comparison to everything else everybody here deals with, uh, why has it then not been done yet? So, so I think the clarity on what is it? is it? Is it a point in time because certain things have fallen into place? Is it this combination of local partners you've found, um, your expertise, where exactly is the momentum, why this, why now, why there? Um, and what I also would, would want to really understand is what is happening to that land, to the smallholders right now? What is it that actually you are replacing? What is it you are doing better? Um, is this a substantially higher standard you are introducing or are you crowding out something else, which I don't think you are, but it was just not explained. So I think all of these aspects of um, where are you faring on the scale of, of good environmental and social aspects, where exactly come your certification 
standards in through the entire value chain or just for the high-end products? Um, uh, what is in it uh, for the community in, in, in this case? Um, what can you do to enhance your, your landscape uh, impact? Um, this isn't the first thing that you've been thinking of. You've been thinking of uh, good sustainable cocoa production, but I think um, this group of stakeholders would be really interested to understand how does it actually uh, tie into this um, yeah, impact, uh, impact world. Um, you focus, I think, for a good reason to also um, distinguish yourself from, from previous pitches. You, you've uh, focused a lot on marketability, operability, financial performance, returns, uh, and I think you've got a very strong case there. Um, but, but how to embed it in all of the problems that we do know exist in the Dominican Republic? Uh, how? How much integrity does the whole value chain have that, that you are presenting? Um, that, that these would be my questions. Danke schön. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you all. And um, we will be shortly breaking out. And so you can choose your preferred investment case and dig deeper in, in the specific uh, aspects of it. But before I let our jurors go, um, I would like to ask uh, two final questions to each of you. So if you could invest your money only in one case, which one would it be? And secondly, what would you expect from the others to make you change your mind? So I think that's a fair, fair way of bringing your final opinion. Tom, <laughs> you were sitting closest. So. <laughs> uh, it's the theory of sitting in the back of the room huh, that uh, I, I experienced in most of my teaching life. Um, I should have, should have sat elsewhere. Um, no, I, I think in the end, probably because of the issues that, that were raised on, on the funds, I would, I would have uh, a greater tendency to look carefully at the... Uh, at the cocoa arrangements, uh, but I would look carefully because this this question, uh, essentially, of of how a firm that has scale capacity can actually monitor and deal with the political risks of outgrowers is is one that has a a long history of difficulty. Right? It's different. You have outgrowers of or, or co-ops. Uh, these are very different structures and outgrowers. In a, in a number of places have presented particular problems and that's where I think the special advantages that uh, Elvira referred to would have to be demonstrated. Um, that said, uh, you want to know what, what yeah. these what guys would have to do? What could make you change your mind? Yeah, exactly. Is there anything that could make you change your mind? Take a more junior <coughs> position to me with their money in this uh, arrangement. <laughs> it usually has a pretty good impact. Thank you. Okay. All right, so okay. I, I'd like to think of three things in combination that would determine which way my money would go. First, I want to evaluate the idea, just at the level of ideas. Is it an idea that I think is going to have a chance at solving a systemic problem? Is it, is it something I'm excited about just at the level of ideas? Mm -hmm. The second thing is people. Are the people concerned capable of implementing the idea, taking the idea, turning it into something that works in the material world? Can, can they apply it to the real life situations that they face wherever they are, whatever they're, whatever they're doing? So ideas plus people. And the third thing is do they have sufficient appreciation of luck <laughs> because, because it's a fundamental component of every success story and every unsuccess story. Can you cope with luck? The, there is, there, there are, there's a fantasy associated with IRRs. The, 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 the notion that somehow all of these are controllable risks and there's a number attached to it definitely do not apply in these sorts of investments. So I want to know, do you appreciate luck or are you lucky? Then, then, then I think that's where my money will go. So, um, because I have to, yes, um, I, I'm going to go for 
um, even though actually I do like all of them, I'm going to go for the one that I think is most innovative because I have a, a um, tendency that way. And so I'm going to go for the um, Althelia Seascapes one um, with a very strong recommendation to practice saying no because you're going to get an awful lot of things that you, you you're, particularly your very good and well-meaning board members from the NGO community are going to say, we must do that because it's very good. But you're going to have to practice saying no because you're going to get a lot of things that are not going to work. Right. But, so I'm going to go for innovation and put money there. And, but the other two could quite easily convince me. Um, I, I'm actually very interested in the uh, sustainable agriculture corporation model where one could make an investment in a private company today or maybe one that is already listed and have diversified risk over a number of assets over a period of years and have that attract talent over time in the sustainability of agriculture. So I actually really like those sorts of investments. Okay. And actually, I think these guys will be fine. <laughs> I think they've got a competent team and they'll raise their money and may not get a billion right away, but I think um, in due course, they'll build something that can be scaled. And um, they, so I'll, I'll keep in touch with them. OK, good, thanks. <laughs> OK, uh, I'll be brief. It has been a long day, and, and you still want to get to the pitches. So, um, if the Land Degradation Neutrality Fund can prove that it can neutralize land degradation, I'm in. Um, but, but that verdict for me is still out. Um, if the COCO project can really deliver a very, very high impact and be very sound on the ENS uh, matters uh, and can put a lot of smart capital really an optimal, not only good use, but an optimal use that really makes it worthwhile, that I'm in, but for now, um, I'm slightly bi biased because uh, Finance in Motion has recently invested in an aquaculture fund, uh, so we're very familiar with the topic. Uh, I think a lot of lessons will still have to be learned by this team, um, but I think it really, the seascape uh, issue is a very, very important one, um, and it takes very committed people, so currently my favorite would be um, the seascape fund. Thank you, everybody. So, constructing an attractive value proposition can be a challenging and a long process. I think selling it to a broader community is even more difficult. And we often heard that um, impact investing is like giving your money away to a good cause. Uh, <laughs> but I think that today we've heard uh, from the three investment cases that the impact and economic viability of projects as well as financial return, they can go hand in hand. And I think all three of you have convinced us of that. So again, thank you very much. And also thank you very much to the jury of guiding us, guiding us with your professionalism.